Good evening and welcome to our lecture on microbial metabolism. We will be talking about uh, metabolism in microorganisms and bacteria specifically, but we will address it and compare microbial metabolism to eukaryotic metabolism. So let's go ahead and get started. These, this lecture is divided into two parts. The first half we're going to look at just basic principles of metabolism, types of reactions, energy production, what types of uh, enzymes and proteins and other players have roles in the actual process of metabolism. And then in the second half of the lecture, which will be a different recording, in the second half of the lecture, we will discuss the actual metabolic pathways themselves. We will compare cellular respiration, aerobic, uh, anaerobic types of metabolism. We will look a, very briefly at photosynthesis and then at the end, we'll tie it all together per organism. So let's go ahead and get started with some basic principles. The basic principles of metabolism, the whole point when we think of metabolism, we think of digestion of food. And what we're really trying to do, at least in our own bodies, and what we're really trying to say is the primary purpose or function of metabolism is really to produce energy. Now we associate energy on a molecular level with ATP adenosine triphosphate. And that's simply because ATP is the primary molecule that most cells, both prokaryotic and eukaryotic, will use for uh, some form of energy. There are other energy molecules out there um, that can be used. Sometimes GTP is used instead of ATP. Uh, they're fairly interchangeable, but ATP is our primary energy currency. Now, metabolism is broken up into two different types of reactions catabolic reactions and anabolic reactions. In catabolism, we break down compounds in order to release the stored energy found in their chemical bonds. It takes energy to create a bond, so that's considered a form of potential energy. Energy is stored in chemical bonds. When we break those chemical bonds, we release that energy that can then be harnessed to do work, and that's known as a catabolic reaction. Anabolism or anabolic reactions is when we actually put energy into a chemical bond to create it. So when we create that bond, that energy gets stored in the chemical bond and thereby can be released later through a catabolic reaction. So what we can say uh, in a cyclic manner is that catabolic reactions provide the energy for anabolic reactions and anabolic reactions provide the energy for catabolic reactions. So it's very cyclic. Anabolic drives catabolic, drives anabolic, drives catabolic. So they both drive each other. One stores the energy, one utilizes the energy. Now when we look at uh, the different functions or uh, purposes, different products we should say of these reactions, in catabolic reactions we are going to look at the breakdown of glucose. That's the primary energy molecule that most organisms are going to use. It's that basic six carbon sugar. And as you can see in this diagram here on the left, on, on the blue side, we have our energy sources glucose and glucose gets broken down. We use glycolysis, transition step, Krebs cycle, and eventually all of those processes provide the electrons necessary for an electron transport chain. So Krebs cycle, transition, and, and glycolysis are all forms of uh, t removing electrons from glucose, basically breaking down or, ox or reducing glucose. As glucose moves through these different processes and it gets the uh, the bonds between the carbon molecules get broken down, some energy gets released. A little bit of energy gets released. Some of the compounds in, in the rearrangement of glucose might get released and we get things like cellular structures, uh, such as ribosomes, uh, structures on a surface, glycolipids, those sorts of things. We can also get macromolecules. So we get the, the base building blocks or monomer units such as sugars, proteins, amino acids, nucleic acids, different building blocks of our macromolecules. We get energy again in the form of precursor metabolites. We'll talk about those a little bit later. Those are, are um, what are sometimes referred to as intermediates. And eventually at the end, you can see there are going to be some waste products. In catabolic reactions, our waste products are acids and carbon dioxide. 
on the right in anabolic reactions, you can see catabolism provided the energy for us to create those cellular structures, macromolecules, and monomer subunits. And any some of the waste products from that, if we have any, are things like nitrogen and sulfur, those sorts of things. So catabolic reactions are degradative. They break things down. Anabolic reactions are known as biosynthetic or biosynthesis, where we're using the energy from catabolism to build or biosynthesize our, or synthesize our biological molecules. Now, the ultimate goal in all of this, besides building our molecules, is the capacity to do work or energy. And so energy is, comes in our two basic forms, potential and kinetic. Potential energy is stored energy. That's what we find in those chemical bonds. And kinetic energy is energy that's actually doing something, sometimes referred to as energy in motion. Uh, potential energy can be converted to kinetic, and kinetic energy can, of course, be um, eventually stored as potential energy. Another form of energy that should be, uh, uh, should be thought about is photosynthesis. And in photosynthesis, light energy, light energy is going to be used to drive an anabolic process instead of a catabolic reaction. So instead of breaking down glucose in order to drive some anabolic process, light energy will be used. And this allows in photosynthesis, what these, these organisms are essentially doing is they're skipping the whole glycolysis and Krebs cycle and those sorts of things. And they're going directly to that electron transport chain. And they're using energy to drive it. So compounds that are created uh, from uh, photosynthetic pathways are then used in other parts of the cell to actually be part of an anabolic process for biosynthesis. So plants, for instance, are going to use light energy to create ATP and another molecule in order to make glucose uh, later in a secondary process. And we'll look at those two steps uh, at the end of the lecture. Now, in order for a metabolic pathway to be carried out, we have to have enzymes. Enzymes are a class of proteins, and enzymes are referred to as biological catalysts. Now, I usually prefer to do this in class. We have a lot of fun with this particular, particular lecture. So I'm going to try to give you an idea of how these enzymes work. Um, first off, a catalyst is a compound that takes part in a reaction. It speeds up the rate of a reaction. However, it doesn't get used up in the reaction. And the second part of that, um, the second part of that definition is really important. We use enzymes all the time, constantly. If our enzymes were just a one use deal, we would have to expend massive amounts of energy to create new ones for all of our different processes. So enzymes are catalysts. They are these proteins that will make a reaction happen. They're going to make something that would normally take a really long time or possibly never ever really happen to begin with. Enzymes are going to bring these molecules together and cause a reaction to happen. I refer to them sometimes as matchmakers. But the really important part of it is that these enzymes can make these reactions happen again and again and again and again. They do it over and over and over. They are reusable. They don't get used up in the reaction that they're making happen. So they're not a reactant and they're not a product. They're just simply this compound, or in this case, a protein, that brings two molecules together, puts them in the right environment, gives them the correct orientation, makes a chemical reaction occur. When the reaction occurs, it releases the products of that reaction, and it is now ready to accept two new reactants. And this enzyme will do this over and over and over again. Eventually, they will wear out, and they will have to be tagged for destruction by the cell. But we can make an, if we can make an enzyme every 10,000 uh, uh, products, as opposed to every single product, that's a whole lot of energy that we can save by reusing these enzymes. So the function of these enzymes is to carry out all of our met, uh, metabolic pathways. They can break things down. They can build things. Sometimes an enzyme, enzyme will require energy to carry out its process. Sometimes it won't. Uh, most enzymes work through uh, conformational change or change in shape. 
But another thing that's important about enzymes besides their recyclability or their reusability is that they're super, super specific. And when an enzyme reacts with something, the enzyme reacts with what, with what is called its substrate. An enzyme is going to be very specific to its substrate. When it does bind to its substrate, it'll create its product. So an enzyme plus a substrate results in a product. In the top right of this slide, you can see we have um, amylase. And amylase is an enzyme you should be familiar with from your anatomy 2 labs. Uh, amylase is an enzyme we produce in our saliva. And enzyme breaks down starch. Starch is a big long string of glucose molecules. And we want to use glucose as a form of energy. But we can't use it when it's in its starch form. We have to break these glucose molecules off. Um, off of the starch so that we can utilize it for an ATP production. And so that's what amylase does. Amylase binds to starch and starts breaking it into individual glucose molecules. If you don't believe me, glucose is a sugar. It tastes sweet. Go chew on a piece of bread for a few minutes. After chewing on some bread or potato for a few minutes, you'll start to taste um, a sweetness. And that sweetness is the starch being broken down into glucose molecules by amylase in your saliva. The more simple and the more uh, starchy the food is, uh, the greater the glucose content, the sweeter it's going to be, which is why bread will uh, be sweeter than, say, rice or a potato. How do enzymes function? Well, they act as catalysts by making reactions, biochemical reactions that would normally take a long time makes them move forward and makes them move faster. And they do this by lowering what's, what's known as the activation energy. They reduce the amount of energy that is required for a reaction to move forward. In doing so, our reaction can happen more quickly and more easily, but at the end of it, we still get the products that we wanted. Enzymes that occur one after the other, because remember, enzymes are super specific. They're incredibly specific about what they react with. So one enzyme will, an enzyme will only react with one substrate. It does not have multiple substrates. So if the enzyme reacts with one substrate, that the product of that reaction now becomes the substrate of another enzyme. And then the product of that reaction becomes a set of, reacts with a third enzyme, becomes a substrate of an, a third enzyme, and so on and so on and so on until we get to the end of a metabolic pathway with our end product. So for example, at the bottom of this uh, slide here, you can see there's a starting compound. That starting compound is the, is the substrate for enzyme A. Enzyme A carries out its reaction, creates a product. That product is known as intermediate A. Intermediate A becomes the substrate for enzyme B. Enzyme B carries out its reaction. The product of that reaction is intermediate B. Intermediate B then becomes the substrate for enzyme C. Enzyme C carries out its reaction and the final product is the end product of the pathway. So that end product is what we're trying to get. That's what the cell wants, but it can't get from from uh, the starting compound directly to the end product all the time. Sometimes it has to go through a series of steps. So when there's a series of steps, each step requires an enzyme because the molecule or substrate is being rearranged over and over and over again by each, uh, each enzyme in the pathway. So what contributes to the function of an enzyme? What, what makes an enzyme actually work? And enzymes are proteins. They go through their, the three or four levels of protein folding. So their function is due directly by their three-dimensional shape. The actual shape of the enzyme is what carries out its function. If you want to keep an enzyme from functioning, you can denature it. Now, denaturation usually refers to a permanent uh, disabling or enabling of an enzyme, right? If we want to end its function or inhibit its function, denaturation is usually, um, most of the time I should say, is going to be permanent, such as temperature. We can't, uh, uh, we can't uncook a steak. Steak cooks and, and, and turns brown and changes color because of denaturation of enzymes from the heat.
So temperature uh, changes that. Potatoes, when we cook a potato, we denature enzymes that are in the potato, and that causes the potato to get kind of fluffy, and it changes uh, its texture. We can't uncook that, so it's permanent. pH is another one. If we want to make pickles, we slice up cucumbers, put them in acid, and the acid denatures the enzymes and changes the enzymes that are found inside of the cucumber. This changes the texture of it and it changes their it denatures their function. These enzymes are no longer going to function. We can't unpickle a pickle. It's going to stay a pickle. The third form of denaturation or inhibition is competition. And competition sometimes is permanent and sometimes is not. But uh, competition is a form of regulation that many cells use uh, on a regular basis. So let's take a look at regulation. Not every metabolic pathway in the cell is functioning all the time. Cells are incredibly efficient. They're not going to, they're not going to make something or carry out a metabolic pathway if they don't have a need for it. So if the cell does not need a particular uh, end product, pathway product, that pathway is going to be turned off. For example, um, bacteria cells have a pathway that they use to make their own tryptophan. Tryptophan is an amino acid that is used in protein production. And many bacteria have a, a tryptophan anabolic pathway, a pathway in which they make their own tryptophan. And we're going to look at how um, the tryptophan metabolic pathway or uh, anabolic pathway can be regulated. Now, first in the bottom left under the letter B, we have what are called competitive inhibitors. In green, that greenish color there, you see that's the enzyme. The red block is the actual true substrate for that enzyme. If I want to inhibit this enzyme and I want to do this competitively, say with a, a pharmaceutical or with a drug, I'm going to create a pharmaceutical or a molecule that mimics and is very closely resembles the actual substrate. But my competitive inhibitor, I can give a higher concentration of it. So if I give a high concentration of this uh, drug, to the patient, to this, this medication to the patient, I'm going to have a higher, higher uh, number of drug molecules than I am actual substrate molecules. So my drug molecule will outcompete my substrate for the active site of the enzyme. The active site of an enzyme is where the substrate binds. It's where all the action, where everything happens. So if the active site is already bound by my competitive molecule, my substrate can't bind. Now my competitive molecule is not going to carry out a reaction. It's not the right substrate. It's mimicking the substrate. And so there's going to be no reaction, but my substrate can't bind either. So I inhibit by uh, competing, out-competing. And the concentration of the competitor is very important. Think about a medication. If you give a patient a medication that's a competitive inhibitor, and the concentration of their medication starts to get too low, then there's not going to be enough inhibitor to stop that enzyme activity. The substrate is already there. You're trying to regulate that active, that enzyme activity. And if you're, you have too low of a concentration of the drug inhibitor, the substrate's going to start binding. It's going to outcompete your inhibitor. And then your process would move forward. Your medicate, you would need to get the medication back into your patient at a higher concentration so that you can uh, outcompete the substrate. Another way to regulate a metabolic pathway, or any enzyme, enzyme for that matter, without having to worry so much about, uh, comp about uh, competition, and that is through a non-competitive inhibitor. Non-competitive competitive inhibitors are going to bind to the enzyme anywhere else but the active site. When they bind somewhere other than the active site, this is known as an allosteric site. And allosteric sites allow us to bind, say, a medication or something to an inhibitor. And when we bind, when you attach something to a protein or an enzyme, it causes the three-dimensional shape 
of that enzyme to change. If the shape of the enzyme changes, then the substrate's no longer going to fit in the active site, and we're not going to see any kind of activity from that enzyme. The pathway will be inhibited. Competitive inhibitors and allosteric inhibitors or non-competitive inhibitors can be either uh, they can be either permanent or temporary. It totally depends. Most of the time, these are going to be uh, non-competitives are usually temporary. Uh, competitives are oftentimes uh, permanent. Now let's look at the last on the right. This is a process known as feedback inhibition. In feedback inhibition, the end product of a multi-step metabolic pathway becomes the allosteric or non-competitive inhibitor of the pathway itself. This is where that bacterial pathway, uh, anabolic pathway to create tryptophan, that, this is where that particular uh, example comes into play. So let's take a look at the top of this diagram on the right, the large one. The red portion there says substrate. Now the substrate is going to bind to enzyme one. Look at enzyme one on the left. Our substrate is bound. Enzyme one carries out its reaction, giving us intermediate A. Intermediate A interacts with enzyme two, becomes the reactant for enzyme two or substrate. Enzyme two creates its, its goes through its reaction, creates intermediate B as its product, and intermediate B becomes the substrate for enzyme three. Enzyme three gives us our end product. In the case of bact our bacteria example, the end product is the amino acid tryptophan. Now, as long as the cell needs tryptophan, that tryptophan will get used up by the cell, making proteins, doing its thing, and eventually, uh, um, and that pathway, excuse me, the uh, tryptophan anabolic pathway will continue to function. More substrate binds to the enzyme, goes through the process, creates more of that little red dot at the, at the bottom of our pathway, our end product, keeps making tryptophan because tryptophan is still needed. But once the cell has used as much tryptophan as it needs to use, and it's not using it anymore, tryptophan will start to build up inside of the cell. As the tryptophan builds up, it will reach a, a threshold, a concentration, where it will begin binding to enzyme one. When it binds to enzyme one, it will do so allosterically. Okay, so it'll bind to an allosteric site of enzyme one. When the tryptophan binds to an allosteric site on enzyme one, enzyme one will change shape and our initial substrate won't bind, which means the cell, the bacterial cell, will stop making tryptophan. Remember, it doesn't need it right now. It's used up. It has used all the tryptophan that it needs right now. It's not utilizing it. There's no sense in going through any of the processes to make it. The cell doesn't need it. It will turn it off. Once tryptophan levels get low again, the cell starts to need it again. It starts to use it again. That tryptophan that bound to enzyme one will be pulled off. It will be pulled off. The enzyme will go back to its original shape and the anabolic process will start again. And the cell will begin, that, um, that process will begin making more tryptophan. The cell will continue to use it till it doesn't need it anymore. It builds up in the cell, binds to enzyme one, stops the pathway. So the cell, when it needs it, it will allow this pathway to run. When it no longer needs tryptophan, it just simply uses the tryptophan itself to stop the pathway. So this is known as feedback inhibition. When a, back, when, a, when a cell, our cells do this all the time, when a cell uses the end product of a metabolic pathway to regulate the pathway that made the product is feedback inhibition. They're basically self-regulating with the product of the actual pathway that, that made it. Okay. Let's take a look at ATP. Now ATP, we've talked about ATP a couple of times uh, in lecture already, but I just want you to remember adenosine triphosphate. ATP is that common energy molecule. And you can see uh, highlighted in red there, there are four negative charges on an ATP molecule. If we break off one of those phosphate groups there, we're down to three negative charges. Uh, this makes ATP a very highly reactive molecule. And the breaking off of that outer phosphate group 
that provides the energy needed to carry out lots of different uh, processes. So it takes about seven and a half kilocalories uh, per mole of ATP. Uh, that's what gets released, the amount of energy uh, when a, a single ATP drops off a phosphate group. So that, I, I use the analogy of a, a, a mousetrap. And we just like, I mean, it just barely touches, an ATP molecule just barely touches another molecule. And that outer phosphate group is going to get released. That's going to release quite a bit of energy. And that energy will get harnessed by the cell to do some work. So how do we make ATP? How do cells make all this ATP so that uh, they can carry out their anabolic processes and biosynthesis of molecules needed? There are three basic forms of ATP production. The first is what's known as substrate level phosphorylation. In substrate level phosphorylation, we get the transfer of a phosphate group directly to ADP from some substrate in an actual pathway. So an enzyme and uh, substrate are required in substrate level phosphorylation. An easier way to remember this is that substrate level phosphorylation only occurs in metabolic pathways. So it only occurs in glycolysis and it's only occurring in the Krebs cycle and it's only occurring in the transition step. So glycolysis, transition step, and Krebs cycle, those are the only three places in glucose metabolism in which ATP is made through substrate level phosphorylation. Glucose uh, metabolism only produces ATP in, uh, in metabolic pathways using substrate level phosphorylation, glycolysis and Krebs cycle. The second form is oxidative phosphorylation. In oxidative phosphorylation, electron transport chains. So when you have an electron transport chain and ATP is a product of it, it is carrying out some form of oxidative phosphorylation. Um, it uses a process known as chemiosmosis. Chemiosmosis uses some, creates something called a proton motor force. We're gonna go into much more detail on this in the second lecture. But you should know that oxidative phosphorylation is associated with electron transport chains. The last one is photophosphorylation, and photophosphorylation occurs with light. So photosynthesis carries out photophosphorylation. We get organic, organic molecules using energy from light. Now you've heard all this talk about metabolic pathways, and I just want to let you know there are three different types. We have a linear pathway where we kind of go from point A to point B. That's the first one up there. We have a, a branched pathway. Uh, glycolysis, for example, is a branched pathway. It's step five in glycolysis. Glycolysis goes in two directions. And the last is a cyclic pathway. And a uh, cyclical pathway, that's our Krebs cycle. We don't really have a beginning or an end. We have areas in which a compound can enter into the cycle and areas in which products can leave the cycle, but the cycle does continue in a cyclical type manner. Now, in addition to uh, enzymes, we need to talk a little bit about what are known as electron carriers. I mean, we, of course, we have enzymes are part of metabolism. ATP and ADP, those are, are parts of metabolism. But we have three other molecules that are really, really important. And these are known as electron carriers. They are also sometimes known as uh, precursors. So the first one is NAD+, the second one is FAD+, and the last one is NADP+. NAD+, and FAD+, are involved in glycolysis and Krebs cycle. NADP plus is involved in photosynthesis. We don't really see that in, uh, in animal cells. We see that mostly in plant cells and in a couple photosynthetic bacteria cells. So NAD plus and FAD plus, and what these guys do is they run around the cell and they look at reactions. And when a chemical bond, particularly a covalent bond, when a covalent bond gets broken, energy is released and oftentimes an electron is involved in that because remember covalent bonds are the sharing of electrons. So if we break open a bond 
that an, in which an electron is being shared, oftentimes that electron is is able to be pulled away from the atom that it was um, that it was associated with. But electrons cannot be on their own. Electrons have to be harnessed. So FAD plus will accept an electron. And when a molecule accepts an electron, it gets reduced. So FAD plus will, will be hanging around, say, glycolysis. In glycolysis, glucose, which is a six carbon uh, molecule, those carbon atoms in that molecule are getting rearranged by all of the enzymes in glycolysis. Glycolysis is a 10-step pathway. So every time glucose gets rearranged by one of those enzymes, there's the possibility of an electron being released. And in two different steps in glycolysis, one of those electrons does actually get released. And when it gets released, FAD plus, or I'm sorry, NAD plus, excuse me, NAD plus is waiting and it's sitting there. And when that electron gets released, NAD plus accepts it, grabs it. So NAD plus gets reduced and it becomes NADH. But what is NADH doing with this electron? Why is NAD plus grabbing an electron? Well, because we have an electron transport chain in another part of the cell. So NAD plus grabs that electron, gets reduced, becomes NADH. NADH goes to the electron transport chain, drops off that electron, and then returns back to glycolysis and accepts the next electron from the next glucose molecule that's getting rearranged. So NAD plus runs around the cell and collects electrons and then delivers those electrons to the electron transport chain. Because the electron transport chain, let's be honest, that's where all the energy is being made. That's where a majority of the ATP is coming from and it needs electrons to do that. We gotta feed the beast. So NAD plus runs around and grabs all these electrons and drops them off at the electron transport chain. FAD plus does the exact same thing. FAD plus is just another electron carrier and it runs around and it grabs electrons and it drops them off at the electron transport chain. NADP plus is used in photosynthesis. And in photosynthesis, the first reaction, the light reaction requires the harnessing of an electron because it's run from an electron transport chain. So the final electron acceptor in photosynthesis is not oxygen. In this case, it's NADP+, and NADP+, will become NADPH. So these uh, uh, electron carriers, they carry out redox reactions. And remember, a redox reaction is reduction and oxidation. It's the movement of electrons from one molecule to another. So if a, an, a molecule accepts an electron, it is reduced because it reduces the charge. Electrons are negatively charged. If a molecule loses an electron, it gets oxidized. And oxidation and reduction must occur together. We never oxidize a molecule without reduction because electrons are too high energy. They would cause all kinds of horrible things to happen inside of a cell. So one molecule, the molecule that gives up its electron is oxidized, the one that receives the electron is reduced. And because these two reactions always occur together, they're referred to as redox. The other thing that we need to, to take a look at here are what are known as precursor metabolites. These are also sometimes referred to as intermediates. Now remember in, a, in the metabolic pathway when enzyme A reacted with substrate A to give, subs, to give um, uh, intermediate B. Intermediate B is a precursor metabolite. When you learned about metabolism and anatomy, they probably gave you, they probably said um, glycolysis and, and primary metabolism results in anywhere from 32 to 36 ATP. So they gave you a range of ATP molecules that are possible from a single glucose molecule. And the reason that we give a range is because not every single glucose molecule is gonna make it all the way to the end to the electron transport chain. Sometimes, sometimes one of those intermediates will leave metabolism and they'll leave that primary metabolism to go become something. So on the left here, we have this bacterial cell and it's showing uh, glucose molecules at the top. 
and glucose molecules enter into glycolysis. And as they move through glycolysis, some of those intermediates become the initial building blocks for other biomolecules or macromolecules. Some of them are the base form of lipids. Some are the base form of amino acids. Some are the basic forms of sugar molecules. And they'll leave metabolism, a metabolic pathway, mid-pathway. They'll go through the first three steps out of five. And at step three, the intermediate leaves and goes and becomes another molecule somewhere else. So in metabolism, it's not a straight shot from beginning of glycolysis to the electron transport chain. Oftentimes molecules will leave. They'll get off the road. I, I use the analogy of a, uh, what I call a metabolic highway. And in the metabolic highway, you think, imagine yourself in a car on I-95. You do not have to go from, uh, from Broward County straight into Palm Beach County without ever getting off the highway. If, if that's where you're destined to go all the way to, to PGA Boulevard, for example, and that's, that's the end of your route, then you could take 95 straight shot. But maybe you need to run a few errands while you're doing it. Well, you get on at Broward Boulevard and at Atlantic, you get off and you go do something. And then you get back on somewhere uh, further north. And then you get off again and you get back on again at Sample or some or at Sample Road or, or some other road further north. So you can get off the highway and you can then get back on the highway. So when a, a, a glucose molecule enters into glycolysis, it is not always destined to become pyruvate at the end of glycolysis or to be uh, reduced all the way through glycolysis and Krebs cycle to become electrons for an electron transport chain. It's just not always destined for that. Oftentimes it'll get halfway through a pathway and then leave as an intermediate and that intermediate is the precursor molecule for an anabolic pathway. It's driving anabolism. We, just as we can leave a pathway at different steps, other molecules, other compounds broken down in other parts of the cell, as they get broken down by their own metabolic pathway, those products can enter into primary metabolism. Glucose metabolism, glycolysis, Krebs cycle, that's primary metabolism. That's, that's the big money maker. So if we break down um, lipids somewhere else in the cell, the, the products of that lipid breakdown, known as lipolysis, the products of that lipid breakdown are going to enter into primary metabolism at some step in either glycolysis, transition, or Krebs cycle. Now, the formation of ATP by metabolism. What are the different steps that we're going to be studying? And uh, uh, the next lecture is where we're going to get into the details of these. If an organism carries out aerobic cellular respiration, aerobic cellular respiration includes glycolysis, in which substrate level phosphorylation will occur, Krebs cycle, in which substrate level phosphorylation will occur again, and the electron transport chain in which oxidative phosphorylation will occur. All of those each resulting in some form of ATP. Fermentation is an anaerobic process. Fermentation will include glycolysis in which substrate level phosphorylation will occur, alcohol fermentation, or lactic acid fermentation. Specific to bacterial cells, we have two other pathways known as the Entner-Dwardoff and the pentose phosphate. And the Entner-Dwardoff produces one ATP and it is used in lieu of uh, glycolysis. So instead of glycolysis, some organisms will use the Entner-Dwardoff. The pentose phosphate pathway runs at the same time as glycolysis, also only results in one ATP, but does occur at the same time. And we'll go into more detail in those pathways in the second lecture. So that's the end of lecture one. I divided this up into two separate lectures to try and make it a smaller movie uh, and a little bit shorter. We will go through a little bit of review next week in class, but um, get ready. We're going to uh, go through the 
actual steps of glycolysis and Krebs cycle and that in lecture two and look at exactly how an electron transport chain works.